inviting me here. I think it's uh, an exciting opportunity to talk about uh, a program that I'm passionate about um, and a program that I think offers tremendous opportunity to every city and town in the country if they are truly um, concerned about um, ways in which they can save money, do things more efficiently, and save the planet at the same time. I want to thank Chris for inviting me and uh, Kristen for probably giving my name to Chris. <laughs> and so let me give you a little bit of background um, about me and about my city. Um, I was the Public Works Commissioner. Um, uh, I'm here to tell you folks that are in public service that there is life after public service. <laughs> uh, I am happily semi-retired, um, and uh, I, I worked for the City of Worcester for 42 years, and I was their Public Works Commissioner for 22 years. I'm a registered uh, engineer, and I've got you know, a bunch of other things that we could talk about, but I'd rather not. Um, and in 1993, um, uh, I had just been elevated to uh, Commissioner of Public Works. And in Worcester, the Public Works Department is, in my mind, uh, the largest Public Works Department in New England. Now, the folks that might be here from New England might be saying, well, what about Providence and what about Boston and so forth. And the reason I say we were the largest is because we were all inclusive. So we had the traditional public works operations of uh, highway and sanitation, as we called it. But we also had parks and cemeteries and water and sewer and wastewater and garage facilities. And so I would tell people, if it's not police and fire, it's, it's us. We were the evil empire. Um, and prior to being named commissioner, I was uh, deputy commissioner. And we, has, we had sustained a number of uh, budgets where we were cutting back. Originally, when I was with the Department of Public Works, our, budget, our uh, staffing was over 700. We were now down to 500, and we were cutting again. And so in 1993, uh, just after being named commissioner, the city manager said to me, you got to cut again. And um, it could have been uh, naivety. It could have been um, lack of common sense. I simply said, I'm not going to do it. We can't cut anymore. There's no place to cut. And so he said, well, you need to find a way to offset that, that dollar amount I'm looking uh, to you to provide. And if you can find a way, then uh, I will most likely agree to it. And so we started looking at all the things that the Public Works Department does, and most of, most of them were driven by state law. And interestingly enough, um, solid waste was not. We have no mandate, and there are some communities in Massachusetts, and I'm sure throughout, that have no mandate to collect solid waste. You really don't have to do it, at least in Massachusetts. Um, so we started thinking about, well, what else can we do? We had a traditional program that people loved. Um, it was buy your black or green bag, or whatever the case may be. Uh, put it at the curbside on the proper day, and presto magic, the waste went away. And if you were so motivated, and again, this goes back to 1993, so it's sort of archaic, uh, if you wanted to recycle, uh, we had drop-off locations in various parts of the community to make it convenient. At the time, we had five drop-off locations, as I recall. Uh, we were recycling 2% of our municipal waste. Um, so in 1993, again, going back to the budget, 
we started looking at what we can do. It included get out of the trash business and just get rid of the whole idea of that we are collecting and say to homeowners, you're on your own. We looked at flat fee with recycling and without recycling. We looked at stickers. We looked at carts. We landed on uh, the, uh, the purest form of pay as you throw. So we, we went to the idea of bags, special municipal bags that folks would have to put their waste in in order to um, have it collected. And um, so that's sort of the backdrop of what was happening in May and June of 1993. We, we made the recommendation to the city manager on to the city council <clears throat> as budgets were being deliberated that we thought the best way out of the uh, fiscal conundrum that we had was pay as you throw. And it was um, hotly debated, hotly debated, and a lot of hand-wringing by city councilors. But at the end of the day, at the end of the, the last day that they could deliberate on the budget, they agreed to go forward with that recommendation, which, by the way, gave me the uh, compelling mandate of a six to five vote on, on behalf of the city council. <laughs> so I felt very secure. <laughs> um, and so that's the backdrop. A little bit about Worcester. It's the second largest city in England. <laughs> There's no one here from Providence because they like to say that they're the second largest. But, um, we're the second largest. Our household median income in 2014 is about 64,000. Uh, the statewide is about 69. If you go over there to the rich areas of Cambridge, and I know we've got some friends here from Cambridge and Boston, it's about 75. Uh, we've got about, um, I do it. Oh, there you go. we've got about 11 colleges in Worcester. 35,000 students, and I tell you this because there's people moving in, moving out. It's a blue-collar town. It's an old industrial town. And some of the colleges include, I've heard somebody say Holy Cross, but Clark University, Worcester Polytech, and a, and a host of others. Um, so, back to 1993, we had this budget shockfall, and uh, we, we looked at all of the uh, the ways in which I could come up with the money so I didn't have to cut anymore because that's the other choice is cut staff and services or the community had to raise taxes or they had to adopt pay as you throw and that's really what the city council was hand wringing about <clears throat> and uh, they knew that they couldn't cut services anymore because there would be a big political pushback they knew that raising taxes would be unpopular. They had no idea how strong the pushback was going to be on going pay as you throw. And so after intense debate, we started down the road of uh, developing a pay as you throw program. So again, this is late June 1993. The mandate was a vote of the city council of six to five. Um, and they also gave me the mandate to develop the program and have it implemented by September 1st. And at the same time, develop and implement a curbside recycling program on September 1st. And uh, so we marched down that road. I do this correctly. What did I do? Oh, hold on. Should be another slide. Okay, here we go. So, um, 
As September 1st approached, uh, I wrote back to the city council and to the, through the city manager that we weren't able to meet this September 1st deadline, that we needed a little bit more time. Because the, the, we were new at all of this. The only place to pay as we throw was happening was in, uh, in, in any kind of a meaningfully sized city was on the West Coast. Uh, we were doing, we were going to be doing the largest pay-as-you-throw program in the entire Northeast. And we really didn't have good guidance. There were a bunch of smaller communities in uh, New England that were doing it, but when they were significantly smaller than Worcester and didn't have the urban problems that we were going to face. Um, and so we developed our own team and we did all the work ourselves in trying to formulate this program. And what does that mean? It means we had to look at how do you deal with renters? What about illegal dumping? A big issue. What do you do about low income folks? Where do people get the bags? How do you make it convenient? so they can buy these bags. What about the retailers that are going to sell the bags? How much money do they want off the price of that bag to put the bag on their shelf? What about the specification of the bag? We're going to be telling people to buy a bag that's going to cost multiples of what the black or green bag costs. It better hold up. It better meet specification. How do we do this? How do we test for the bag? Who's going to distribute the bags? All of these things, we had to, we, my staff, uh, had to uh, deal with, along with the education part. How do we let people know, here's this new program, uh, and here's when it's going to start, and here's how you comply, and here's what happens when you don't comply. Here are the penalties. Here's how we're going to enforce it. It was a big, big task. And again, we didn't have really a lot of folks to look to. Uh, certainly, um, EPA gave us some uh, assistance. And the State Department of uh, Environmental Protection in Massachusetts you know, couldn't have done more for us. Uh, but still, a lot of it was on our own. We went out and we hired a, um, we did go out and hire, we made one hire, and that was to promote the program and try to get the word out. And so we had brochures printed, I communicated every week to the city council so we could get through the newspapers, we took out full page ads, we had pamphlets uh, presented, we had uh, radio and television um, uh, spots, PSAs, talking about the program, when it's coming, how you comply. We had billboards across the city on every major artery that came into the city that would advertise the program. We came up with a tagline. The tagline was, pay a little, save a lot. And the, and the, the emblem that we used, I guess that's what we called it, was a recycling bin with the earth inside the recycling bin. So you pay a little for this bag, you save a lot. And the message here was you're going to save the environment. So we, um, we marched down that road, and um, I asked for permission to delay the program to the end of November and uh, was granted that permission. In the meantime, the mayor of the city chose not to run again, and two very formidable candidates came forward. One was uh, in favor of our pay-as-you-throw program, an environmentally-minded college professor from the College of the Holy Cross who supported the program. A history teacher, by the way, John Anderson. No, he's not. 
Uh, he might do some uh, guest lecturing, but uh, he's not. The other fellow, uh, uh, a political force and a political opportunist, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, <laughs> who was also chairman of the Public Works Committee that I reported to you know, in, in a legislative way, came out of post. And uh, I didn't make a photo of this, but he had, I remember it distinctly, he saw this as an opportunity to, uh, to uh, make a lot of political hay, if you will, about the program. And it was the single issue of the day. There was no other issue. And Ray, who was the political opportunist, came out with a pamphlet and said, even if the Department of Public Works does a bang up job and collects 98% of everything that's discarded, all the trash, and only 2% is illegally dumped, here's what the city's going to look like. So he, he really pushed the fear of illegal dumping. And actually, in retrospect, and I've told him this, it was to our benefit that he did push that fear. On election day, and, and Ray, Ray's, uh, Ray's uh, you know, political speech was, vote for me. Now, it's, it's, it's in early November. We're going to launch the end of November. Vote for me, and I will repeal the program, because the program was moving down the path to implementation. Vote for me, and I'll repeal the program. The other fellow said, vote for me because I'm in favor of the program. It's fair. It's equitable. It is the right thing to do. It's environmentally positive. All the attributes of pay as you throw. And on camp day, Ray had at each of the polling places, some 35, 40 polling places, his campaign supporters with signs that said, vote for Ray and he'll repeal the pay as you throw program. And he had them all dressed in trash bags. So they had trash bags over their heads. So you couldn't miss them. Ray won. Ray won. So I heard somebody talk about why not pay as you throw. Besides all the things that Janet said about, you know, here's the reluctance and there were things like illegal dumping and so forth, the single bi biggest issue in my mind is the political courage it takes. Ray won. We launched our program on the Monday after Thanksgiving. And the final coup d'etat to let people know that we were launching the program was, as everyone knows, during Thanksgiving weekend, there's all kinds of high school football games being played. We had each of the football fields buzzed with a, with a plane carrying a banner. The pay as you throw starts Monday morning. We had a radio station in the city that actually uh, spent their entire program day from 7 a.m. in the morning till like 4 in the afternoon uh, devoted to pay as you throw. And we had the guy who was the uh, commentator on most of that show um, indicating to citizens that he was not going to comply and the station and I'll never forget listening to him. <coughs> he said, that guy Moylan, he must be eating, he must be eating tums the size of truck tires. Um, anyway, so we launched the program. Um, and some details of it. Uh, we were going to be providing weekly curbside trash and recycling to over 52,000 household units. In order to comply, you had to use these special yellow bags Notice the Boston Red Sox logo. Uh. You had to use special yellow bags and you had to put your recycling in bins. We, uh, this became a political decision 
Uh, we had two size bags, a 30-gallon bag and a 15-gallon um, bag. And the 30-gallon bag was priced at $1.50, and uh, the other bag was priced at uh, 75 cents. And this, you know, this became the engine that drove the program. This is the engine that drives all the benefits. It's what people don't like, but it's the way you get that change in behavior. And so this is what gives you the incentive to recycle. It's, it's, it's pretty simple stuff. Um, we had at the time, only because I know there was some discussion of, about this, the cost of uh, solid waste was buried within our budget as, uh, as a general tax levy line item. This number was arrived at politically that allowed us to subsidize the cost of that, of trash collection, by the revenue and other savings that we were going to benefit by, by virtue of the sale of that bag. So, for instance, if it was a $5 million per year cost at that time, and we were going to take in $3.5 million, then the net tax levy amount became $1.5 million. And that, that did for the city manager what he was looking for. That gave him the cut, in fact, more than what he was looking for. Let's see. Bob, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So you've got clear yellow bags. Was that for the sake of uh, giving your, your collection crews the ability to see whether or not folks were throwing out recyclables, and then you had some education and enforcement, or? Well, uh, good question. Yes, we made the conscious decision that we wanted clear yellow bags. By the way, the bags we have printed on them have all of the uh, important instructions on how to comply. So don't put more than 30 pounds in a 30-gallon bag. Leave it out at the curbside, you, you know, at such and such a day, uh, time. But we also wanted to let folks know that they needed to be complying with the waistbands. We had mandates on the city imposed by the local uh, Department of uh, Environmental Protection that we could not dispose of uh, recyclable material. And so we wanted to let folks know that we. One of the things we'd be looking at is making sure that there, that there wouldn't be banned material in the back. Yes, so it was a conscious decision that we made. So we launched in on November 29th, and a couple of things happened that were to our benefit. The first is that between November 29th and January 1st, I don't think we got any snuff. It was big. That's big because the city of Worcester customarily gets about 72 inches of snow per year. But almost immediately, we saw the trash get cut in half. And in fact, by the end of the first year, our waste was reduced from 45,000 tons per year to 22,500. Recycling, and again, I put an asterisk here, because we went from 2% to 36%. But at the same time, I'm measuring uh, uh, drop off to then what we did with curbside. So, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that most communities that have curbside recycling that don't have a pay as you throw component in an urban area, at least the ones I'm familiar with, are probably up somewhere around the 15%, maybe 20%, some are lower uh, recycling. So we went up to around 36%, and it's probably leveled off at like 33%. I found this to be interesting. The average number of bags used, and you would see in front of a single family home before we did the program, you would see multiple bags. You would see three, four, and five 30 gallon bags. And we collected up to six family units, and in front of those, uh, kind of homes, residences, you would, you would, you, you might see 25 bags, 30 bags. 
we now went down to 1.2 bags on average. And when you do the arithmetic at $1.50 a bag, 52 weeks a year, it's less than 100 bucks. That's what it was costing people to comply with the program on average, get curbside recycling, and a host of other things that we ended up putting into the program that we could fund because we now have this source of revenue in cost savings, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the other thing that manifested was that compliance. In the first week, I'm doing this from memory, but in the first week was uh, in the 95% range. We had a really good program that we articulated to citizens about how do you comply, what happens if you don't comply, how will the city check. And so I think people, and most people wanted to comply. Some want to push the envelope, um, but we had like 95% quickly ramped up to like 99%. And, um, and even with the transients that come in and out, people moving in and out of the city uh, who may not know fully how to comply with the program, <laughs> our compliance rate is now uh, in excess of 99.9%. Um, interesting thing is that since Worcester launched the program, we have been at the top of the charts on a per capita disposal of waste in the state. So we are under, we are under 350 pounds per person. The state of Massachusetts <coughs> on average is over 800 pounds. And you've got friends like, you've got uh, uh, folks or uh, communities like Boston where they're above that 800 pounds. And interestingly enough, um, after we launched the program, uh, the fellow who was the commissioner of public works in, in Boston was a, a good friend of mine. And um, he was um, being pressured by the local state authorities to look at our program and to try to mimic our program because the results were so startling. Um, and he just had a philosophical difference about trash. And I remember sitting down with him and, and I said, Joe, I'm not pontificating, but for us it worked. I know the challenges for you are different. Many will be the same, some might be different. And he said, uh, you know, I'll never forget it, he said, uh, look at, uh, I just believe that trash collection is, uh, is something that should be provided in the property tax. And I don't believe that people should pay separately for it. And then the other thing that he said that I'll never forget is he said, Bob, Take all of your material, if you don't mind, and go out the back door. I don't want anyone seeing you that you came in the front door. So anyway, he was spooked by what we did in Boston, and they're still challenged by, um, you know, by trying to drive up their recycling rates. Um, illegal dumping, I talked about because it was one of the central themes of the fellow that ultimately became the mayor. And so our program was very much geared to illegal dumping, to make sure that no one could say that this program was contributing to illegal dumping. And in fact, because we, because we had shined a light on illegal dumping, it actually went down. And most illegal dumping, as Jen said, is not about people taking out their trash and putting it somewhere. Most of it is C and D, uh, homeowners doing home improvements, tires, and the like, and you've seen that. The program, our program, Pay As You Throw, because of the savings accrued, allowed us to spend money to focus on uh, controlling and uh, eliminating, reducing illegal dumping. Whereas before the program, we didn't have the money to do it, and it was sort of I guess it was sort of accepted because that's the way it had always been. So we started measuring illegal dumping. We started measuring what we were picking up, the locations, what the material was, 
And over the course of a short amount of time, you could see it all drop. And then we were able to publicize, and we were able to uh, tell people uh, that God help you if you have these nefarious thoughts about illegal dumping, because we are everywhere. <laughs> and one of the uh, one of the uh, the funny stories that came out of that was uh, we had cameras. We probably had at the time four or five or six locations that were prominently. Um, uh, being used by folks that were dumping illegally. And we, we tried to make it sound like we had thousands of cameras out there. And we would position rocks and boulders in such a way that if you wanted to dump illegally at these places, you would have to pull in. And in such a way that the camera that was somewhere <laughs> would see you. And um, we once had a, a, a fellow with his, I guess it was his girlfriend, pulled in somewhere to dump a, I think dump a TV, and we had a camera in a tree that went to a recorder somewhere else. And I don't know if this guy thought it was a camera tree or what, but he noticed the camera. And he got out of his car and stood on his hood and reached up into the tree to get the camera. All the time he's being recorded <laughs> along with his number plate. He was arrested about two hours later. <laughs> Can I ask a question about the recycling, just yep. for a second? Um, I just want to understand the recycling increase. That's not the participation rate in curbside. That's the percentage of municipal solid waste. That, okay. And do you have, did you have at the time a single stream kind of mixed no. materials? Everything was separated. Well, it was, we had dual stream. You had dual stream? Dual stream. Paper and everything else? Paper and everything else. And, and, and single stream came later. And your trash collection before the yellow bags, the trash collection was just in whatever bag the people whatever sat Whatever bag. So there was no cans in, uh, that were No, no, it was, it was okay. black, green bags. Yeah. So um, I take it the first line, 45 to 22.5, is, is early year, change, uh, change in early years. These later, these later numbers are, are holding in more recent years, like you said, it sort of leveled out 33%, here at about 1.2 bags. Is that right? All the numbers have essentially flatlined. So the 22.5 is still a pretty good number. Mm -hmm. um, the 1.2 bags is a good number. The 350 is a good number. 33 is, I mean, 36 is more like 32, 33 now. And your 36% and your three, was it 350? That's residential, you're looking at residential. residential numbers? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, again, we take, we would collect from about um, somewhat over 100,000 folks, uh, a population of 185,000. We would do six family units or less. Mm -hmm. So people that were living in apartment homes or uh, condominiums, many of them were not included in our program. And I was just going to comment on your number, something that I noticed between pay-as-you-throw programs in bottle bill states versus pay-as-you-throw programs in non-bottle bill states. So their recycling number at 33, 36%, they have the bottle bill. So a lot of those materials don't end up in that curbside recycling number. And your number is curbside only. It's not other recycling materials or yard waste or anything. It's just straight right. curbside collection right. in a bottle bill state. Right. So, it's not, so it's, it's not including a bottle bill number, so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that's moved into the commercial because it's counted. Or the yard waste. Or the yard waste. And if, you we all have, if we include yard waste, we're over 50%. Do you have an organic span? In not, yet. Not, yet. No? not yet, but we're, 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 I'm no longer with the city, but we're, I'm advocating the city leadership to look at that. And, and we've got some plans. I think the city has plans to move forward in that direction. I have two quick questions. If Ray got elected, he was the bad guy, right? Ray? Ray did. He got elected to that. He became the mayor. Huh? He became the mayor. Right. Well, then how did you guys get that program? Was it already in the because, because, as I said, we launched the program at the end of November. And he took office in January. Okay. Oh. And the program came out, which, with such success, oh. that none of the fears that were being talked about, illegal dumping, failure to comply, compliance rates, um, again, I say snowstorms, thank God we didn't have any, um, 
it just came out of the, the gates as good as we could have ever expected. And so, even though he was a political force, and he was, uh, he was not able to get the necessary votes to overturn the program. That's right. One more quick question. Um, so if you're recycling up there, it's only still now about 50% this program was started in 93-ish? Yes. What's the, what's the reason it's not 100%? And I'm not criticizing it. I'm just curious about why it isn't evolved to 100%. Not everything. No, that's a percentage of yeah, that's a percentage of the waste stream that's being pulled out. Okay. It doesn't include organics yet. Huh? It does not include okay. organics okay. yet. And of course, the the composition of materials has changed from right. now to yes. ninety three. Right. We don't get soda in aluminum cans anymore. We get it in in uh, plastic bottles. Yes. The the bottles that you get water in are a lot thinner than they used to be. Yes. So the, the weight of the recycling, and remember these rates are by weight, the weight of the materials that you're putting in the recycling, the newspaper is probably thinner than you used sure. to read. The weight of the materials you're putting in Very the recycling is less than it used to be, the weight of the materials. Well, just look what happened with newspaper readership anyway. Yeah, exactly. Who's getting hard copies versus digital. Right. The uh, figures you have for weight you didn't have to do a, a sampling or something before it went into place. Is, is, isn't this something that cities are measuring anyway because of ticket fees and everything? You already have good numbers for how much what the trash stream looked like before and after. So those numbers yeah, were yeah. easily obtained. And, and I'm sorry, I guess I missed the, the, the essence of the question. In order to make a good comparison, which yes. is not, it's great. You, did you already have ready access number of 300, less than 350 pounds per household. Yes. Because those are numbers that cities typically have to have for their yes. solid yes. waste management. So a city isn't going to extra expense to suddenly do a pilot study and see what's going on already. That you already have. So you have a good comparison of yes. right? Yes. You have a graph. Yeah. Um, yes, sir, in the back. Okay. So since you had such an increase in recycling, uh, one, we're at a There, there was an increase because we, we ended up um, citing a MRF just outside the city, or a, a private company cited a MRF outside the city. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that would have happened without Worcester contributing uh, the recycling tonnage that it was, without, and, and that wouldn't have happened without pay as you throw. Mm -hmm. How many people are employed there is something I, I'm not familiar Yes. So how does that? Um, initially, coming initially when the program uh, started, uh, we were able. We used to have a bulk collection program that was quote unquote free. Through budget cuts, we lost that collection. With the introduction of pay as you throw, we realized money, and we were able to um, reinstitute the bulk collection free. So it's part of that pay a little, save a lot. And so what we would say is, you're going to pay the dollar fifty for a 30-gallon bag, but here are the things, and we have a list of things that we were going to provide, additional services. Um, and some related to solid waste and some didn't. Some were, you know, improved uh, street maintenance because, you know, streets and sidewalks are the bane of most public works directors' lives. And so, you know, we, we would say we were going to improve the condition of streets and sidewalks with some of the additional money. Chris, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. So, so I really appreciate sort of uh, being here and sort of listening and learning. Uh, and so in terms of bulk trash collection, it is the single largest service request we receive and has been as long as I've been at DPW. Last week we received 3,147 requests for bulk trash pickup. Uh, 
we have, we also have a litter can collection or a litter bin collection program, about 6,660 litter bins throughout the city, not including litter cans in bid zones. So those uh, five or so business improvement districts that do the collection in partner with us for, dis for, uh, for disposal or to, to take to our transfer stations. And so I guess for, it was interesting sort of to hear that the bulk trash program was sort of halted and then brought back. And I'm wondering if, while it wouldn't traditionally be considered illegal dumping, taking personal trash and placing it in litter bins, for us, it is a big challenge mm -hmm. currently. And I wonder uh, if you could just talk about uh, sort of what, if you all have a litter collection program, sort of these litter bins, if you saw any sort of change in usage there. It, it is a challenge. And uh, in our case, in our city, we, we had the litter containers in the central business district. We, we didn't have as many as you have. Um, and we didn't find um, a, a measurable increase in uh, personal trash disposal in those locations. Instead, what we found is in the various parks of the city, public parks, where we have litter containers, we would find people in and around the park that would use the litter bins to dispose of trash. For parks, it became, um, you know, it became an enforcement uh, issue, and we had a, uh, it was either a regulation or a city ordinance that prohibited the use of uh, the disposal of personal trash in those bins. To what effort did we uh, go through to try to enforce it was, you know, it, it fluctuated. But if we were really being besieged by people who were dumping illegally in those locations, yes, then we would do some enforcement. Um, <clears throat> the other, the other area that I think there was an increase were in private litter containers, both the ones that are, that the uh, business area might be putting out. Mm -hmm. Those folks had to deal with uh, neighbors nearby using those containers to dispose of personal trash. And also um, places like CVS <coughs> that have litter containers outside. Now, having said that, the litter containers were being designed so uh, they really wouldn't lend themselves to someone dropping off a 30-gallon bag. If you wanted to take a small CVS bag and, you know, and, and put some litter in there and take it from your home instead of using a bag, I guess you could do that. But we weren't finding people uh, you know, trying to stuff a 30-gallon bag in any of the litter containers. So, but it's, it's nonetheless, it's an issue. And, you know, there's no perfect pro, there's no perfect way to design these programs. I think you have to look uh, into yourself and say, here's, here's what my community does. And so what's important and, and put that, immerse that in the details of the program. I know that somebody mentioned um, tenants really. What do you do with tenants? Well, in some cases, <clears throat> Homeowners are responsible for compliance by the tenants. In Worcester, we chose not to do that. We said tenants are uh, responsible unto themselves. They aren't the responsibility of the homeowner. And if they're doing something improper or putting out their bag and not, being, not complying, we'll deal with that. That's how we dealt with it. One last question. So I'm thinking in terms of information technology needs associated with the curbside pickup. Um, what happened for crews that actually are responsible for picking up the bags? How did they account for this particular household and how many bags they picked up on a particular day? Did, did, did they sort of have some, some tablet that allowed them to, or some way of saying we picked up two bags today uh, and three bags next week or whatever? Well, 1993, there were no tablets. No tablets. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
illegal dumping or non-compliance was a big issue, as I indicated. And, and the way we the way we enforced it was simply this: we had trash collection guys. We had 14 crews of three guys each, two guys on the back of load packers, a driver, and they would run. And if somebody left out a non-compliant bag, it's non-compliant. It's black. It's green. It's not the official city bag. It weighs too much. It has recyclables inside the bag. That's a banned waste. They took a sticker out, they put a sticker on the bag, and they said, this is non-compliant because they checked it off, and you, the homeowner, had 24 hours to make it right. You had to make it right and get it off the curb and put it out again next week. Now, if you ignored that, I had another crew of guys that would go around the following day and let's say you ignored that. Let's say you put out a black bag, a green bag, or a heavy bag, whatever it was. We stickered it, and you chose to say, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm going to move it down in front of my neighbors, or whatever you're going to do. We picked it up. And then we went through the bag looking for evidence. And very often, we would find evidence, and then go back to you and say, hey, you made a mistake last week. You made a mistake last week. I know you didn't. You forgot about it but you're going to put out a yellow bag. And we kept track of how many people made mistakes. And if they made them too often, too frequent, they started getting penalized. And we had an escalating penalty rate, you know, 25, 50, 75, 100. I don't think anybody ever got more than a $50 fine before they finally started to get it. These guys mean business. So I made sure, we made sure, no bag was on the street more than 24 hours. We also made sure, just some other little tidbits, I had a guy at the transfer station or at the uh, waste energy station when the trucks would tip because I wanted to know if they picked up a black bag, those guys that were picking up behind the load packer were never to pick up a black, green, non-compliant bag. So you'd see this sea of yellow bags come out there was a black bag in there, I wanted it picked out and I wanted to know who, who put it in there and why did the crew collect it? Were they collecting at the, the guy's wife, girlfriend's house, mother's house, his house? Everybody had to comply. The fire department had to comply. The police, there were no exceptions. You want to get rid of waste? Using us? Comply. You don't? You're on your own. Fire, fire, firefighters were taking waste in from their homes, they lived out of town, and they would put it in black or green bags, and it was part of the fire department's trash, and we were picking it up. When we instituted the program, trash from fire stations dropped in half. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I assume the yellow bags were being sold, sold at the stop and shop, the local grocery store, Yes. $1.50 a pop. How did they get you all the money? Month yes, and in fact, just a little, a little diversion on that. I told you about all the things we had to consider as we planned the program. Well, nowadays, if you plan a pay-as-you-throw program, you will find that the retailers like Stop and Shop and others will, um, God bless you, carry the bag as a lost lead. When I did it, it must have been just coincidence. But they all said no. <laughs> we aren't going to carry the bag unless you give us a piece of the action, so to speak. And I held firm because I didn't want, I, I thought it sent the wrong message to the community that would charge me a dollar fifty. The city's going to take up the cost of the bags, plus we're going to give a nickel to the retailer or whatever the number was. So we held firm, and there were ways in which we got them to come around. Uh, I threatened to shut off their water if they didn't see it my way. Um, so they came around ultimately, and, and now it is the norm that they carry. They carry. So we had CVS carry bags. We've got over 150. I don't know if I put that in here. Uh, 150 retailers uh, that carry the bags, so it's not a problem. Uh, this is. Uh, these are just some. Um, Clippings from the local newspaper at the time. Uh, this is circa uh, 
1994, even though it says 93 up there. Uh, but you can see some of the, um, the um, headlines uh, in recycling Worcester is at the top of the heap. We were among a handful of communities that were recycling at that rate. Um, compliance real, reveals civ uh, civic pride. And even though we had a, lot, a large segment of the population that was really skeptical about this program, it was funny, it goes back to that peer pressure thing. Uh, you didn't want to leave two bags out because everybody else in your street was only leaving out one bag. You wanted to find a way to get down the one bag. And Nirvana was, if you could find a way to get down the 15-gallon bag, then you were really something in your neighborhood. So that, that kicked in, and, and, and honestly, people took a great amount of pride in the fact that we were doing what everybody said couldn't be done in a blue-collar community like Worcester. They said, oh, you can do it in, for those of you from uh, Massachusetts, Brookline, maybe. <laughs> or Newton, maybe, maybe even Cambridge. Never get it done in Worcester. Never. Um, city sets recycling records and so on. So this is a graph of the tonnage. Uh, I really don't have an explanation for these two blips. I think it was my assistant's calculator was malfunctioning those two years. But you can see what happened with, uh, we were up at one time at 50,000 tons. And you can see it, it, it dropped, it went up a little bit, then it went back down. So MSW down 55 percent, uh, 447,000 tons diverted over that period of time. Program revenues over about a 20-year period, we've taken in nearly $47 by virtue of sale of bags. Operational savings. We went from 14 crews of three collecting the bags and, and the 50,000 or 45,000 tons to 22,005. So now we're down to seven or eight crews of two. We were able to collect, cut our collection crews 28 people. Those positions went over to the highway section where people could see the benefits of doing more street and sidewalk maintenance. Disposal savings, because we've cut our tra trash in half, we were able to save over that same period of time uh, $21.4 million. Net financial impact over 20 years is about $94.5 million. Wow. I have a question. Yes, sir. When, you're, when you started working with these financials, let's, let's go back to the beginning of the program. I think when it keeps one, you did a great job. My experience has been important in urbanized cities, such as DC and some of these other cities. What, what investment? I know you bought in one person. What did you spend on the education? Because sometimes it's hard to justify what you spent to educate. You know, you talked about a whole lot of things to get here, but one of it was getting buy in from the <laughs> What I, what I remember is we brought in a, um, a public relations firm to help us with getting the word out as opposed to just doing it the traditional way of us trying to make up our own folders and our own pamphlets and buying space in the local <clears throat> newspaper. And what they brought with them is their own their own powers of economies of scale. Because they were in the business, they were able to talk to media outlets and get a better deal than we might have gotten. Now, again, 1993, my memory is we had a $50,000 budget. We were a community of uh, 38 square miles. Uh, what would that cost today? You can kind of escalate and figure it out. But it was invaluable, in, at least in terms of making sure that people knew when it was coming, and how to comply. That was invaluable. So, conclusions. 
Uh, I call I call our program the um, you know the 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 truest form of pay as you throw, um, and I think it's the most effective way to reduce MSW for a municipality. Um, you can't underestimate the political courage it takes. The interesting thing about pay as you throw is that in my experience and at least my knowledge of pay as you, pay as you throw communities in, in the Northeast, those communities that have gone forward with pay as you throw and they've gotten over the political hump of doing it, never never reverse. They don't they don't they don't change their mind. There was one small town in Maine that changed its mind. It went from pay as you throw to non pay as you throw <coughs> back to pay as you throw. And there's a story behind that. But the interesting thing is uh, once they go that way they don't they don't they don't reverse. And in a place like Worcester, unlike a lot of cities and towns that I'm aware of, solid waste is no longer an issue. The only issue that gets raised in, in Worcester is, is it time to raise the cost of the bag again? We've only raised it twice. We've gone from 50 cents at the inception of the program to a dollar to a dollar fifty, and I think this year it's going to be a dollar seventy-five. I think that the city manager is trying to go forward with a dollar seventy-five. Otherwise, it's a non-issue in Worcester. Has anybody ever tried to uh, counterfeit the bag, print up their own? No, not that I'm aware of. It has the no. instructions. Okay. Yeah, plus, plus, the, it, yeah, I, I, it would be too difficult, I think, for them. They'd have to find a way to distribute them, or even if they kept it to themselves, it would be too, too much of a lift. You have to. The one caveat to all of that, it's not counterfeiting, but you have to price the bag. You have to price the bag. I think pricing is an important factor in that you want to price it so that there's an incentive to change behavior, but you can't price it so high that you encourage folks who want to go into a private business that will say to you, you know what, the city's going to charge you four bucks a bag, and I'll do it for two bucks a bag. You don't want to encourage that. Um, so, uh, dollars saved from the pay as you throw program, as I indicated, can fill budget gaps, can reduce taxes, can fund other city and town programs. Uh, you can use it in a whole variety of ways. Public works people often say, God, if I only had the money, I could do this great program. This is a way you find the money within your budget to do the great programs. It's embedded in your budget. Consider. Anybody know Chinese? In the Chinese language, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One representing danger, the other opportunity. Think about that. Thank you. Yay.